is LBC. From Global's Newsroom at 8 o'clock, the government has agreed a new pay offer with some healthcare unions. It includes extra money for last year as well as a 5% increase for the next financial year. Sarah Gorton's head of health for Unison, one of the unions which says its members should accept this deal. She told LBC it won't be enough to bring back some workers who've already left the NHS. We know that particularly for people who've been very hard pressed by the cost of living crisis, you know, they've they felt they've had no other option than to either go on strike to try and challenge the, the pay uplift or to go and work elsewhere. French police have fired tear gas as 7,000 people protested in Paris against the government's plan to raise the retirement age from 62 to 64. President Macron argues the reforms are essential to ensure the pension system does not collapse as life expectancy continues to rise. The US Pentagon says the actions of a Russian jet as it apparently poured petrol over a US drone amounted to reckless behaviour. Washington's been defending its decision to release footage of the incident over the Black Sea. American officials say Russia is trying to find the drone wreckage, but it's unlikely to recover anything useful. The Chancellor's defended his budget, saying it will encourage people back into work. Jeremy Hunt's denied plans to scrap the lifetime pensions allowance will only benefit rich people saving for retirement. And TikTok's been banned from all government devices with immediate effect after a security review raised concerns about how data is used. Ministers can still use it on their personal gadgets, though. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt told LBC he's already removed the app from his phone. I did take TikTok off my phone when I became Chancellor because I just wasn't quite sure how the location tracking function worked. I have seen uh, my kids looking at TikTok and it is very addictive. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up 65 points at 74.10. The pound buys $1.20 and €1.16. LBC weather, clear spells for most tonight with some patchy rain in the far southeast. A few scattered showers in the north and west and a low of 1 degree. Rain in the far southeast tomorrow morning turning drier and brighter later. Scattered heavy showers elsewhere, mainly in the north and the rest. A high of 14 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Daryl Jackson. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Very good evening. It's three minutes past eight on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. Now, let's talk about the war in Ukraine, because I, I kind of feel that the war in Ukraine has slightly dropped off the news agenda. I mean, OK, we've had this um, this footage today of this Russian plane, um, well, should we say damaging at the very least, a US drone. Um, I think the consequences of that might be quite interesting. It's interesting that the Americans don't seem to have gone overboard in their reaction to it. Um, but generally, given that we've only just gone through the first anniversary I think over the past week or 10 days, we haven't probably talked about it as much as we should have. Well, I'm joined in the studio by Bill Browder, who many of you will remember came in, I think it was about a year ago, Bill, yeah, wasn't it, to talk yeah. about your book, Freezing Order, which has just come out in paperback. Um, so we're going to talk to Bill about the war in Ukraine, sanctions and all sorts of other things. But there is a character that you talk about in your book, Bill, that let, let's start talking about him, Vladimir Karamurza. Now, um, he well, you you tell the story yeah. of what's happened to him. Let me tell the story. So, um, wh- one of the biggest one of one of my main uh, objectives after the murder of my lawyer Sergei Magnitsky in Russia was to get justice for Sergei. And one of the ways we discovered to get justice was to freeze the assets and ban the visas of uh, killers from Russia and other kleptocrats. <clears throat> and that law became known as the Magnitsky Act. And I went around the world to advocate for that law. And we now have 35 countries, including the UK, the US, Canada, that have that law. And one of the people who helped me get that law passed was a young man named Vladimir Karamurza. He was a Russian citizen and a British citizen. And he was able to show up with me at various parliaments around the world and tell the um, parliamentarians what the Russian people felt about the Magnitsky Act, which is they liked it because they liked a piece of legislation which punished the killers in the Kremlin. And he was very effective, very charismatic, and very brave. 
and Vladimir Putin hated him for it. And in 2015, Vladimir Putin tried to kill him with poison in Moscow. Vladimir was in a coma, multiple organ failure, barely survived, but pulled out of it. I begged him not to go back to Russia. He, he said, I'm a, I'm a Russian politician. I have to go back. They poisoned him again in 2017. Thank God the um, uh, doctors who treated him before were the same ones who treated him again and saved him. And then right after the war started, he was here in London. My book had just um, was just about to come out. And I asked him, I said, since you're a character in my book, I'd love you for you to come and, and um, give a speech at my book launch so that, so that people can hear your story properly from your mouth. And he said, I, I, I will definitely be there. Um, I'd be honored, but I'm going to Moscow. This is after the war started. And I said, Vladimir, you can't go to Moscow. And he said, how can I ask the Russian people to stand up to Putin if I'm afraid to go back to my own country? He went back to Moscow. He went on uh, CNN and, and MSNBC. He called Putin a murderer. An hour later, there were police cars outside his house. He was arrested. <clears throat> and he's now, he's on trial right now for high treason, facing 24 years in prison. 24 years in prison. So... I've now been on a campaign to get justice for Vladimir Karamurza. And one of the things since he helped me get this Magnitsky Act passed was to to get people who have the Magnitsky Act to sanction the people who put him in jail. And interestingly, the U.S. has done it. They've sanctioned a bunch of people. Canada has done it. But Vladimir is a British citizen and the British government has not done it. Why? It's just it's shameful. It's shameful it's weak, and it makes you wonder what the value of a British passport is if the government here, he's a British citizen, and they won't lift a finger for him. Uh, have they given any reason? They've, there's no reason. It's just the, the government doesn't work. But given the situation with Russia, given the sanctions that this country has imposed on Russia, given the fact that, I mean, we're not at war with Russia, but we are supporting Ukraine, which, which is... Um, I can't understand the logic of that. I can't understand the logic either. And, and it's, 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 very, it's horrible because here you have a guy who has a British passport where, where other countries are, are standing up for him and this country is not. And I know we're going to talk about a lot of general subjects, but he's a friend of mine. The, the country is failing him and I just wanted to get that out there. I mean, the only <clears throat> logical response that I can think the government could come up with, but in this case, I still think it's wrong, is that, well, we can't interfere in the ju judicial system of another country. Well, then why is the U.S. and Canada yeah. interfering in the judicial system of another country? There's no judicial system. The guy has protested the war. They're putting him on trial for 24 years. We all know that that's bogus. It's, there, there's no reason. It's, um, it, it's, un, it's inexplicable and indefensible. Let, let me slightly play devil's advocate, because that is my job. <laughs> um, I mean, if you go back to Moscow, as you warned him not to do, and you call Vladimir Putin a murderer, you kind of know what the consequences are going to be for doing that, don't you? Indeed, indeed. I mean, this is... So um, why, why would he do it then? You know, he, 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 is, he is built of different stuff than almost anyone I've ever met. It's, it's, uh, and it, he's not the only one. There are other Russians. Alexei Navalny, remember the, the guy who, who uh, the movie just won the Academy Award? They, they poisoned him as well. Um, he was recovering in Berlin. They said, if you come back to Moscow, we'll arrest you. And he went back. There, there's a certain thing among a very small group of these dissidents, which, which is hard for us to understand. The mm. bravery of these people to go back and stand up to their dictator is something that we just... It's, it's hard to understand. And if, if you look back in history, there are lots of examples. I was in Berlin recently. I went to the um, Museum of German Resistance. And, of course, that, that was paying homage to people who did resist Hitler. Um, and you, you read some of the stories and you thought, if I'd been in their position, could, could I have had the bravery to do what they did? And virtually always my answer was, no, I wouldn't. Well, I mean, we even have in many countries politicians that are are so scared to lose their job they won't do what you know do what they're supposed to do. Whereas some people will die for their country. Let's move on to talk about what's happening in Moscow, and um, we'll come on to Ukraine. I mean, obviously, this is all related to what's going on in Ukraine. How strong do you think Putin's position is compared to the last time we spoke, almost a year ago? I think it's actually stronger, surprisingly. I mean, it's, it, it's, it seems illogical. So he's lost 165,000 soldiers. 
There's been sanctions imposed on every aspect of the Russian economy. There's just a total devastation of their military. But he has, he has presented this to the Russian people as, as a sort of us versus them fight. If you, if you listen to their rhetoric, it sounds like Ukraine is invading Russia. It sounds like NATO is invading Russia. It sounds like he's, he's on a righteous mission to defend the <clears throat> honest, decent people of Russia against all these mm. evil sinners, these Nazis, these fascists. And he's gotten everybody r- riled up into this f- f- nationalist fervor, which, which is very, very effective in Russia. And people that you would never expect to be you know, volunteering to go to the front line are all, you know, hyped up and, and ready to go. And it's, it's hard to, hard to even imagine that, that all the terrible stuff he's done to his country, and he still has the support of his people. Even despite the fact that there are presumably, I mean, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of relatives of Russian soldiers that have been killed in Ukraine, and the body bags come home, and yet they, they're still 100%, well, maybe not 100%, but still fully behind him. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the mothers and grandmothers and sisters and brothers of those people who have died are for him. Um, but, but uh, <clears throat> you know, remember, this is a country that sent tens of millions of people to their death in World War II. You know, this is a country where human life has no value. And so 165,000 soldiers is kind of a drop in the ocean. And, and furthermore, it's not as if there's any forum in which people can complain. If you, if, if you go out into the streets of Moscow and you carry an empty sign, um, they'll arrest you for protest. And so it's, it, it's, they, they've pretty much well, taken... to be fair, that's been done here recently as well. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I guarantee you that the fate of any protester here is, is about a thousand times better than the fate of a protester in Russia. What can be done, though? Because... I mean, when you're in any kind of conflict, whether it's military or otherwise, part of the way that you uh, try and win that conflict is not just by sort of <clears throat> military means. You've, you've got to win hearts and minds. And given that the internet exists now, which it hasn't done in most of the wars in history, um, surely there is a way of reaching the Russian people that can bypass Russian state media. Because it, if you're right and that the, the, the Putin's position has been strengthened because he's, it's just relentless propaganda on, on the media to the Russian people, surely the West should be thinking of ways of bypassing that somehow. Well, I mean, we, 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 we kind of can and kind of can't. I mean, on, on one hand, you have this situation where <clears throat> there's no more Facebook, no more Twitter, no more Instagram, no, no more <clears throat> BBC, no more... Financial Times, so all, all the main sort of sources of information have been blocked, <clears throat> and that, then you have, um, uh, you know, kind of the the, the I mean, there, there is there is one very narrow possibility, which is people can buy a buy a VPN, which is a way of bypassing the the blockage of the internet. But you know that that's something for the very sophisticated. It's not something mm. for the um, person living in the provinces who's just watching watching the TV, and so. I don't think we're going to win their hearts and minds as long as Putin is in power. I think that the way that ultimately this changes is if the Ukrainians win the war, if they push Russia out of their territory. If they, if they succeed in doing that, then Putin, he doesn't really have a place anymore. You can't be a strong man and lose. Uh, Paul in Paisley is asking, did the UK government under Boris Johnson move fast enough with sanctions? As I know, some of the oligarchs had time to transfer property and funds before they were enacted. Well, I, I think that, that it, was, it was very frustrating, um, the, the sanctions. When, when the, the war started, it took, a, it took probably, I don't know, um, six or eight weeks before the first oligarchs got sanctioned. And um, and then when they the, and you can see these things happening in real time. I can remember one of the big oligarchs was sanctioned. He said, "Ah, I, I, and there was like a, he had a huge house in North London, huge house, like fifty million pound house." And he said, "Ah, oh, uh, that belongs to my sister. Um, it, it was transferred yesterday." Hmm. And and so there, there's a lot of that stuff going on. And but having said that, the one thing I can say is that the British government has gotten a lot smarter recently about all this stuff, and they're starting to look at how these oligarchs are evading sanctions. And I've spoken to government officials about this. And they're going to start going after family members, after, after bankers and trustees and, and those types of people who are helping the oligarchs evade sanctions. And it's not going to be a pleasant experience. 
Well, if you have a question for Bill on any aspect of Putin, Moscow, Russia and Ukraine and the war, do give us a call at 0345 6060 973. I should tell you also we are streaming this hour live on Global Play if you want to watch us as well. You're listening to LBC or watching LBC. It's quarter past eight. This is LBC. It's not cross-question. I suppose I am kind of questioning Bill Crowder, but not very crossly, it <laughs> has to be said. Now, Bill, let's take a few calls because there's a lot queuing up. 0345 6060 973. But I actually want to start off with a rather provocative text from Amma who says, Bill Browder is too personally involved in this. He can't think straight. Ukraine is losing the war despite the propaganda and in the end will have to negotiate with Putin. Also, forget about Crimea returning. The West is just using Ukraine to weaken Russia um, with China now siding with Russia, stalemate beckons. Now, if you weren't here, I would be saying that Amara is a Russia apologist and should be ashamed of himself. Well, um, <clears throat> I mean, let me just push back on, on the, those points. So um, Ukraine is not losing the war. Russia is losing the war. Russia has lost 165,000 soldiers. 54% um, of the territory that they took have been t has been taken back. Um, a, a huge part of the um, Russian uh, military apparatus has been destroyed. Putin's economy is in a, a totally terrible state. <clears throat> and the most important thing we need to understand is that if... If for any reason Russia were to win this war, um, we would then be at war with Russia because they'd be at the uh, Lithuanian border or the Estonian border. And so this is not just Ukraine's war. This is everybody's war because we don't actually want to be at war with them. And so the easy way to avoid being at war with Russia ourselves is to help the, Ukraine, the Ukrainians win the war. 
And, and but we, he says that Ukraine is <coughs> losing the war despite the propaganda. Now, for, for non-military non-military uh, experts, it's quite difficult to gauge in that Russia doesn't seem to be gaining any territory, but nor do the Ukrainians seem to be winning much back. Well, the Ukrainians won a whole heck of a lot of territory back. That's quite a few months ago, though. Okay, that's true. And and then then everything kind of ground to a halt in the winter. You can't move a tank through muddy marshes. And so um, everything has basically stopped until the spring. And then in, in the meantime, there's been this horrific war in, or this horrific battle in, in Bakhmut. And the Russians are apparently losing <clears throat> seven soldiers for every one Ukrainian soldier that's, that's they've been lost killed. They've thir- lost apparently 30,000 they've lost so far in that one town. And so, so they're, all, they're all fighting over like n- no territory. Um, the Russians aren't winning. They're grinding, their, their whole um, sort of personnel has been ground down. And, and we're all waiting for, for the spring thaw, at which point there's just an unbelievable amount of equipment that's going to arrive in Ukraine for the Ukrainians to use in a spring offensive. And so uh, I'm, I'm actually hopeful that the spring, the, Ru- the Ukrainians will push the Russians back further. And I think I read today that Poland has supplied four MiG fighters to Ukraine with many more on the way. Do you think that is in any way a game changer? Well, I don't think four is a game changer, but when we when we all, all of our fighters are supplied, it will give the Ukrainians air superiority. And while those are the first jets to be provided, we're training the pilots right now. There's pilots training here. There's pilots training in the U.S. There's pilots training in Europe on all of these Western aircraft that will eventually be supplied. And I think that that combined with the tanks, combined with the um, long range missiles, um, could be very, very upsetting and terrible for Vladimir Putin. Um, a journalist friend of mine, uh, I don't know whether he wants me to say his name, so I'm, I'm not going to because I haven't got permission, but it's quite an interesting DM he's just sent me on Twitter. He says, I have a friend who works for a, at a senior level for one of the big global tech hardware firms. While sales to Russia have been cut to zero, they're experiencing a boom in sales to countries friendly to Putin. These sales more than make up for any losses made from Russian sanctions. They know where the hardware is going. How does Bill think this legal loophole could be closed? I, I, th- this is a huge problem, and it's it is in every different segment of of technology and and other things that we've tried to stop supplying to Russia, and and you know if if a country like Azerbaijan is becoming a way station for evading sanctions, um, Azerbaijan is not a big country. It's a country that has to face the West, and it's a country that has all sorts of relations with us. Um, they're going to have to stop doing that. And um, and this is not something which has gone unnoticed. Your friend, the journalist, has probably written about it. And people in the State Department and the Foreign Office and the European Union have read those articles and are, are going to act on it. This is not going to carry on for another year. So you would expect sanctions against any country that in, indulges in this sort of trading? Yeah. So I, I would expect that 2023 is going to be the year that we crack down on this sanctions evasion, the, the countries and the people and the situations where um, are, you know, where the loopholes are being created. Now, that might be okay for countries that the West would seem as not massively important. But I mean, I don't know if this sort of thing is being conducted by Indian firms. Now, that would be quite, a, quite something for a British government to impose sanctions on India. It'd scupper any hope of a trade deal. Um, I mean, would you really expect that to happen? Well, I mean, it's not like we're going hat in hand to India for a trade deal. They want to trade with us. We want to trade with them. I, I, I don't think that a big country like India is going to want to ruin their relations with all, all the major countries of the G7 over sanctions evasion. I think that that's, a, that's a probably a, a not, a, not a great position to sit in. Right. Let's go to Jay in Windsor. Hello, Jay. Great conversation, very informative. Um, look, my my it's a more general question. The use of Russia, <clears throat> like the use of most uh, the world, is very very connected somehow. They will find a way. I'm, I'm talking about your twenty year olds, yeah, um, and they're not dissimilar to other countries. You know, they they think kind of the same thing. Um, how are they communicating? Because I I think they'd find a way of finding out what the news is, what's happening in the rest of the world, because we are so connected. I cannot possibly believe that, I can't believe that 
that they're not managing to dip into uh, the BBC or the news, you know, whatever's going on. Because I think that's the answer, the youth of Russia. Um, and, um, you know, that your average person is pretty connected. Even on the Russian television, you know, when you see these interviews, very brave journalists talking to the youth, and I know some of them won't talk, they're all, they've all got their phones in their hands. You know, it's an extension of our body part now, yeah, in everywhere. So I don't understand how they don't realize what's going on. Yeah, it's like the Indian, you know that um, conversation where the Indian uh, audience laughed when he said, when he said Ukraine declared war on Russia and, you yeah. know, there was this yeah. hilarious. So, I, 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 you know, they're not blind. They're not stupid. These kids are very switched. I, I'm not calling them kids. Young adults are very, very switched on. How, I don't understand it. I just well, don't get it. Well, well, well I mean, some of them, um, the ones who can, have left Russia. You remember when the, when this war started, um, uh, and, and and after they they instituted the draft, um, there there was like seven hundred fifty thousand people left the country because they didn't want to end up um, you know being uh, cannon fodder on the front line. But when you see that phone in their hands, that phone's not like our phone. That that phone doesn't have the BBC app. It doesn't have um, Twitter. It doesn't have Instagram. All that stuff is banned in Russia. It's, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine on your phone, you can't get any information. And, and, and they, have, they have their own versions of that stuff. So they have um, something called Yandex, which is like their Google. But Yandex censors stuff. And so if you wanted to s- search under, you know, dead Russian soldiers, you'd, you'd get no results. And so it, it's kind of, they're living in a, in a parallel universe. They're living in an alternative reality. And, and yes, some of them may actually know what's going on because they have, they're technologically savvy and they can like bypass through the uh, VPN system and get, get uh, news. But it, let's say that they, they get that news. Are they, are they going to go and talk about it publicly at, at risk of being arrested? Probably not. They, they might be talking about it in, you know, quietly in their own kitchen, but, but not outside because nobody wants to lose their job, be arrested or, or whatever. Uh, and this text from Eva in Ealing really illustrates the way that the propaganda does work. She says, I watched two minutes of a video today compiled by a Russian guy exiled in Poland. He interviewed a few people in Russia before he fled. And what I saw on this film, uh, two minutes because I had to switch off, was that not only Ukraine was to be taken out, but also Moldova, Romania, Poland, and so on. These were, these were comments from passers-by, and they wanted all of the population of these countries killed, including infants. I couldn't watch anymore. It will stay with me in my head forever. I was born in beautiful Poland. London has been my home for 39 years, but most of my family is in Poland. I mean, that's quite something. And, 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 and I've seen similar videos, and you see these people, like a nice little old lady in Moscow who then starts talking about killing Ukrainian babies, and it's just so upsetting. How did these people end up like that? It's, it's like Nazi Germany. It's, it's, uh, it's really shocking. Jay, thank you very much. Let's move on to James in Uxbridge. Hello, James. Hi there, guys. Just a very quick question, quite controversial, actually. Would it not be easier to just put a price on the guy's head? Put a campaign out talking directly to his inner circle, saying, look, you will be fine, you will be safe, we will give you a British passport, just do the job. Um, Because I cannot see how this war is going to end. We can place whatever sanctions we want to place on this guy, but the fact is, the more sanctions we place, the more India and China go, hmm, we can get much cheaper rates now that everyone's, you know, now that nobody's buying from Russia. I just can't see it ending. And I think the only way to do this is to put a price on his head. Well, you know, it's, it's um, first of all, uh, I'm not convinced that if Putin, let, let's say that Putin were to just drop dead naturally of a stroke or heart attack tonight. I'm not convinced that the, um, the, that the situation would change. I mean, that there's, they've got so much tied up in this whole war. Um, the, the Putin regime has stolen so much money that they would probably just replace him with a guy, uh, you know, the, the head of his National Security Council or of his defense minister or some other hard man who would can carry on doing the same thing. And to the extent that that wasn't the case, the one thing I can say about Putin is he's not good at a lot of stuff. He's not good at running an economy. He's terrible at having a military. His military is a disaster. But the one thing he is really, really good at is, is staying alive. And he's so busy looking for conspiracies. He's looking for disloyalty. 
He's trying to snuff it out before it ever surfaces. And I mean, there is, in my opinion, zero chance that there's ever going to be an uprising among his people. There's never going to be a coup because he is so paranoid. Remember that table? It was like a 25-foot table. He was sitting at one end because he didn't want to be too close to anybody. I mean, the guy is totally paranoid. Do you you think he's being told the truth about the situation in Ukraine? Well, I've heard an interesting story, which is that he's, because he's so paranoid, he doesn't want to use the internet. And, and so all the only information he gets are from his own sources. And his own sources, of course, are, are you know, blowing smoke up his backside because they want to tell him whatever they're telling him. And they told him that, that this war was going to last three days. They said, and, and by the way, they, there, was, <clears throat> there was a huge fund, somewhere between 10 and $20 billion that they had to pay off Ukrainians before the war started. And one of two things happened. Either they, um, uh, the Ukrainians were paid the money and then didn't put down their weapons when they were supposed to, or more likely, the guys who were supposed to pay off the Ukrainians kept the money for themselves, told the boss that everything is all ready, it's going to last three days. And, um, and so he ends up with this complete mi- wrong picture of how it's all going to play itself out. Because if you think what's happened over the last year, when the Ukrainians have not caved like they were expected to, they have. You're right; they have won back some territory. They they have fought like tigers, and I ju- I just wonder if if you if you as the leader of the country that is waging war on Ukraine don't have the full information, how, how can you? Even if you're the most brilliant military commander that's ever existed, how can you possibly her military strategy when you haven't got the full information at hand? Well, I mean, th- that's absolutely right. And, and, and on top of that, he, he, he micromanages stuff at, at the top. So he, he's busy, like, you know, ordering battle plans. And that's, you can't fight a war where, where the people on the, on the battlefield are not making decisions for themselves. But he so distrusts his own generals and, and people down the line that he's the one who has to make these decisions. And so many, many more people die than, than would have otherwise died because he's, it's so dysfunctional from top to bottom. Keep your calls coming. Bill Browder with me until nine. It is 8.32 on LBC. Let's get the latest news headlines from Daryl Jackson. There could be an end to most of the NHS strikes in England after several unions said they would recommend a new pay deal to their members. It includes a lump sum payment for the current financial year and a 5% pay rise for next. French police have fired tear gas as 7,000 people protest in Paris against the government's plan to raise the retirement age from 62 to 64. The French president, though, says the pension reforms went through without a vote in Parliament. And 11 US banks have announced $30 billion in uninsured deposits into First Republic Bank to rescue it as its shares tumble. The US Federal Reserve says a show of support by a group of large banks demonstrates the resilience of the banking system. LBC weather clear spells for most tonight with some patchy rain in the far southeast, a few scattered showers in the north and west, and a low of one. This is LBC.
Politics on LBC. Bill Browder is with me, author of the book Freezing Order. No, is, is that right? Fre- yeah, Freezing yeah, Order. I, that's I, the right I, one. I did get it right. Yeah. And what's your first book called? Because I mean, that, both of these books have been absolute top bestsellers, haven't they? Yeah, the number one New York Times bestseller. Red Notice is the first book. Freezing Order is the second book. Uh, Freezing Order just came out in paperback, and um, it hit number four on the Sunday Times list. We're hoping it hits number one. Absolutely. Right, let's go back to your calls. Uh, David is in Lucerne in Switzerland. David, hello. Hello, good evening. Um, good evening, Ian. Uh, we already spoke before once. And uh, good evening, Bill. Um, I, I'm currently working in defense um, at one of uh, Switzerland's largest defense companies and also stationed at uh, the largest military air base. And that is a point of my daily life, the current war between Russia and Ukraine. And also especially because my girlfriend is from Ukraine, um, even though she grew up with me together in Germany. And I've got a question on your prediction on the geopolitics, especially if the war is going to end. Uh, It may take some years, maybe even a decade, who knows. And maybe um, I think that Russia could be breaking up um, due to different uh, reasons, either internal or external pressure. And my question is, what are your predictions on the geopolitics following that? Because um, Russia is currently acting as a mediator between different conflicts um, at long as, uh, its long border. And also the different autonomous regions will have different interests. Maybe we'll, they will become independent countries and so on. I'm really not sure. And uh, I'm just curious on what your stance on that is. Well, my, my, my feeling is, um, as you said in your preamble, um, I don't think this war is any ending anytime soon. I think that um, uh, Putin can't show any compromise. He can't really negotiate. He's got to keep on escalating. He always has. That's that he's never he's never been a man of moderation. He's always been a man of escalation. He has no reverse gear. He's just going to go forward. And the Ukrainians on their side have no capacity to give up. He's, he, they've been raped. They've been tortured. They've been murdered. Children have been taken away. Their territory has been taken away. They're not going to negotiate. And so I see this thing grinding on and grinding on. And, and it really very much depends on us how it ends up. If we can give the Ukrainians the, the equipment, the military equipment that they need, they can end this war. And they've been asking for a lot of stuff. They've been asking for jets. They've been asking for long-range missiles. They've been asking for more and more artillery. We've been giving them some of the stuff. Um, Just today, the first four jets came in from Poland. But there's a lot more stuff we could give them, and we have to give them for them to win this war. And if if we don't, this thing could drag on, as you say, for 10 years. And and I should point out that this war didn't start on February 24th. It started in 2014 when Putin Mm. invaded Crimea. Do you think there is, though, the willingness or the staying power within the West to continue supplying uh, weapons, ammunition, equipment in, in to the extent that they have done so far? Because, um, I mean, we read that in Britain we have virtually no ammunition stocks left because it's all being given to Ukraine. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a crazy amount of, of weaponry that's being used over there. Um, I mean, for example, in one month they use the same amount of bullets and ammunition that America produces in one year. So it's it's a crazy amount of of, of, uh, of bullets and so on. And, and th- my, my biggest fear is not what we can produce. I think we can ramp up production and I think there's all sorts of storage facilities and so on. My biggest fear is, is the United States. Um, you have uh, the Republican Party, you've got an election coming up. Tucker Carlson on Fox News he did, a, he did a little survey where he went out and asked each candidate whether they support Ukraine. And the, t- the two leading candidates, Donald Trump, who we know doesn't support Ukraine, and then Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis is the governor of Florida, who is the, the sort of number one front runner. He gave a shocking answer. He said, this is a territorial dispute, now, not an invasion, a territorial dispute in which the U.S. has no national security vital national security interest. And that scares me in, in a way that nothing else has scared me because if you look at the numbers, the United States supplies about 60% of everything that Ukraine gets. And if for some reason one of these people is elected who says, I'm not going to do it anymore, Putin could win by default. He, he, all he has to do is last until 
Ron DeSantis becomes president. And that's a really scary thought. It's deeply ironic, isn't it, when traditionally in this country we would have thought of the Republicans as the sort of more tough ones on on the <laughs> military issues rather than the Democrats, but it, it's no longer the case. They were the total hawks. They were yeah. the Cold War hawks. They were the people you could always count on to stand up firm to the Soviet Union, to Russia, etc. And now you've got these weird pro-Putin people in the Republican Party, and um, it's, it's, an, it's not a party that many people could recognize mm. as being the Republican Party. Um, a text here from Richard, and you see, this is the things that I just don't understand. It says, Ian, were the Russians not right in attacking the U.S. drone? You think, where does a question like that even come from? Well, he, this may be Ivan from St. Petersburg and, and not Richard from, from wherever. I mean, it's, um, wh- wh- why? Oh, it's, a, it's an Alexa message. <laughs> yeah. Well, that says everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just don't understand the mentality of a person that can even ask that because the drone was, as I understand it, in international airspace. Um, the fact that it was American is immaterial. If it's in international airspace, um, there was presumably no reason for a Russian plane to attack it. And yet the automatic assumption is that the Americans are the bad ones here. Well, I mean, the, the Americans weren't firing anything from that drone. This was an information gathering drone. And the fact that, um, the fact that Russia, I, I, the videos of that, of that whole story were, were quite extraordinary. There, there mm-hmm. was this Russian warplane that like started dumping gas on this drone. And you can see the pictures. I mean, it was, it's, it's like, you know, it was, I mean, the, the Russian plane attacked the American drone. Thank God there was nobody in the drone because if somebody had died, that could have yeah. been, a, been, a, been a pretty bad thing. Uh, David, thank you very much. Let's go to Carol in Epping Forest. Hello, Carol. Oh, hi. Yeah. I just wanted to say um, Bill is a, is a hero of mine um, from everything that I've um, heard about him and read about him. Um, my husband got actually got um, uh, a book, uh, got you to dedicate your book to me when he went. You were at the National Liberal Club. Um, so I'm just, you know, just wanted to say thank you, you know, for everything that you do, because uh, you. you seem to be the only person that's actually doing that. And if, if I mean, if you read the book, it's just mind-blowing what you've actually come across and you can't believe it believe it really um but the other thing i wanted to ask you was um i was really kind of pleased to see that um navalny um won the oscar for his documentary um just you know, a couple of days ago um and that ended up you know him saying you know if he died um then that was you know not to not to be too upset because that really means that um, they can't beat us. We're too strong, and that's what they have to do. And so it means that we're really that strong. But I just wonder, do you think that, um, you know, who is there that can um, follow on from Putin other than these people that are complete maniacs that are currently sur- surrounding him? Well, well, so is there my, my... a kind of moral person? Is there somebody that's going to actually, you know, take them on to a proper future, which they currently just are heading completely down? Well, it's it's an it's a super important question, which is um, is you know is there a, a sort of uh, a decent future for Russia? And, and I wouldn't put a high probability on it, but you know if if Ukraine defeats Russia, and and the troops are pulled back, and Putin is seen to be a loser, the Russian people may one day say, you know, we don't want you, and we don't want anything to do with you or all your people who've stolen all this money and done all this terrible stuff. And I I, I have this fantasy of watching these. You know, oligarchs and Russian officials jumping on their private jets and flying to Saudi Arabia or Belarus or wherever they think they can be safe. And I, I and then I have this fantasy of of um, that you know, so uh, of half a million people storming the Kremlin and then a bunch of other people going to the jail where Alexei Navalny is being held and breaking down the gates and pulling him out on their shoulders and he becomes the next leader of Russia. I mean, I view Alexei Navalny and my friend Vladimir Karamorza, who I told you about at the beginning of the show who is also in jail, and, and there's another one named Ilya Yashin. These are all very brave people, and they kind of remind me of Nelson Mandela and the rest of the African National Congress who are all sitting in Robben Island in, during apartheid South Africa, and then one day their, their time came. And that's my hope. I don't, again, I don't put a high probability on it, but that, that's where Russia could go in the right direction with, with you know, some decent people, some Democrats, some people who are, believe in free speech, who are not totalitarians. Um, and so it's not hopeless, but at the moment it doesn't look very good. 
Carol, great question. Thank you very much indeed. We'll come to more of your calls in just a few moments' time. It's 8.46. LBC. too fast don't they because i've got so many people that want to speak to bill so um i'm going to shut up and let them do so darius darius is in brentford hello darius good evening i'll be very quick uh yevgeny prigozhin and wagner group could you do, what do you think about them and why they are having issues with the regular army of russia so who so, is the so, 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 so yevgeny prigozhin <clears throat> is the head of this mercenary operation called the wagner group and because uh, Russian military is so bad, this guy has sort of emerged as an alternative military. And he's gone to all the prisons in Russia. And he's said, I, I need murderers. I need rapists. I need uh, people involved in, in gross bodily harm to join my army. If you join up, you can spend six months on the front line and then all of your sins will be forgiven. And so he's grabbed all these people, <laughs> taken them to the front line, and, and they don't have enough ammo to go and fight the Ukrainians. And so he just forces them to run out into their positions and get shot. It's kind of, if you watch that movie, All Quiet on the Western Front about World War I, it's like trench warfare in World War I. And as you mentioned earlier in our conversation, they've lost like 30,000 of these guys in this battle of Bakhmut. Yevgeny Prigozhin is a very bad man. He's like the, he's like the sort of Hollywood villain. I mean, central casting. The guy is like such a Bond a, film. Always. He's so evil, so so evil. This guy, um, and 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 I kind of I think that Putin kind of puts him out there almost like a scarecrow. Um, so he says to the world, you know, look, it could be worse. You, could, Yevgeny Prigozhin, could be running Russia um, as as sort of like a way. And and I I know people that say, 
you know, um, if Putin wasn't around, you'd have someone worse. Well, I, I don't think you could have someone worse than a guy who's threatened nuclear war, who's killed all these people in Ukraine in his own country, et cetera. But, but anyways, Yevgeny Prigozhin definitely is a, a nasty piece of work. And it's been reported today that the Wagner Group is now trying to recruit new soldiers via adverts on the Russian version of Pornhub. <laughs> I don't know what to make. Maybe it'll stiffen their resolve. I don't know. Bad check. Right, let's move on. Let's go to uh, Hack, who is in Westminster. Hello, Hack. Hi, uh, uh, hi, Mr. Bell. Bell. Um, I heard you said um, yeah, uh, 165,000 Russians have died uh, in Ukraine. Well, would you mind to give us any figure about how many Ukrainians have died? Uh, and if you don't know, how come you are so sure about Russia when we don't know about our own people how many died? The other thing is, we all talk about Russia has to beat, has to lose this and that. How comes we never talk about peace? And how comes when it comes to peace, why we, we are always rely on Russia? We never forward any peace proposal. Russia, uh, we, have, wait, have, you, have you forgotten that Russia invaded Ukraine? You talk as if they're the injured party here. No, but, but 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 there was a reason behind it. But we never talk about the reason. The reason was NATO expansion. We never talk oh, about the NATO expansion. Here we go. Here we right? go. Wait, 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 another Russian apologist. Another Russian apologist. It's okay. Let, let me no, no, let me no, talk no, to you. Let me. Well, so, 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 then why is Russia not in at war with Finland and Sweden right now? They they just joined NATO. It, it doesn't. That, that, it's a totally empty argument to say that NATO expansion is what caused this. Putin invaded a, a peaceful, unprovoked a neighbor a neighboring country. There was no provocation. There was nothing that happened. He's killing Ukrainians. He's taking their territory. He's raping women. He's torturing, um, torturing prisoners of war. That there is, there is no, there, there, there's no two sides to this argument. This is a one-sided argument. Putin is evil. The Ukrainians are victims. That is the story. What, what about the initial question about the number of Ukrainians that have died? Well, I think that there's a lot of Ukrainians that have died. I've seen these videos of these um, cemetery, these military cemeteries, and they go on forever. I, I, I think it's a tragic, horrible thing. And I, I, I watch this every day. And there's, you know, musicians and computer technicians and nurses and all sorts of people, regular people who went to defend their country who have been killed. It's just heartbreaking, horrible. Um, somebody's texted here, can I ask what Bill thinks of Seymour Hersh's report about the Nord Stream pipeline explosions? Well, I know a little bit about this guy, Seymour Hersh, because Seymour Hersh joined in 2016 a Russian government operation to try to stop the Magnitsky Act, the legislation that I was proposing um, to punish Russian human rights abusers. He joined a propaganda, Russian government propaganda campaign to stop it. And he introduced a movie, a Russian government propaganda movie in Washington, saying that that all the stuff that I was saying about Putin was wrong and that um, Putin is a good guy, et cetera, et cetera. And so Seymour Hersh, he might have been a great journalist uh, one time when he exposed the My Lai massacre, but he's gotten crazy and sort of bent in in, in later years and, and he's been fully discredited recently. And this nonsense about uh, that the United States blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, I don't agree with at all. Well, Mehdi Hassan, who um, was here in that seat last week, presenter on MSNBC, um, I asked him about that as well and he said uh, he certainly didn't think it was his finest hour, let's put it that <laughs> way. Uh, let's go to Robert in East Grinstead. Hello, Robert. Hello, good evening. Thanks Hello. for taking my call. Hi. Um, I was going to ask, I, I haven't been to the Ukraine. The nearest I got to that region was Moldova and Romania in about 96, and I found um, very, very lovely countries. I enjoyed myself there, thought very nice people. Uh, my question is, um, I think a lot of people noticed the spelling of Kiev changing in after February 2202, uh, February 2202, 2022. It's an easy one to remember. Everyone noticed, yeah, everyone okay. noticed I think I'm with you. changing. Um, does the Bill have concerns about that being a, a strong indication of bias in reporting in the West? Well, I mean, we, we, we call Turkey now Turkey, or, or however, uh, there's some new, new spelling of Turkey, you know, you call this. Uh, Leningrad, St. Petersburg. I mean, how, how we how we describe you know these countries, these cities based on on their 
on their cultural uh, history and their their preferences. I don't think is really. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And and, and I, I are you sure that that we started calling Kiev Kiev? Kiev Absolutely. In, uh, there were discussions about it on the BBC, sort of pointing out the change and why it's changed. And I mean, the, the, the point to make is we didn't start calling Moscow Moskva, did we? Um, well, I, I, um, I, I think that it's still called Moscow. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, my, my, Moskva. Moskva is well, the Russian pronunciation. That, that's true. But uh, I, I, I've, I've heard of Kiev being called Kiev a lot, a lot earlier than than. Uh, uh, February twenty fourth last year. Right. Um, right. So I mean, uh, I haven't. I you know, I guess I've got to go listen to that BBC show. But um, I don't think that that changes anything for what it's okay. worth. Okay, Robert. Thank you. Uh, Bertus is in Wimbledon. Hi, Bertus. What would you like to say? Um, hello. Um, I think we've spoken before, but um, I, there's uh, there's something that's starting to bug me a bit. Um, I mean, um, I'm a South African, white South African. Um, you know, I grew up doing apartheid. Um, I didn't see South Africa compete at the Olympic Games for 20 years, my whole of my youth. I didn't see us play international cricket, um, occasional rugby games, never any football. Um, that was, wasn't fun, but it did place an immense amount of pressure on the apartheid government. And, and maybe not the driving factor, but it was one of the big factors that brought about the changes in South Africa, coupled with you know, a number of other things as well, economic sanctions, etc., um, at the outside, at the outset of the, the Russian invasion, um, there was quite a big move to exclude Russians from international sport and Belarusians. But that seems to be waning now. I mean, I, I'm phoning in from Wimbledon, and it, it's shocking to think that the ban that Wimbledon had last year, they now are freely talking about lifting that ban. Um, you've got Russian and Belarusian tennis players freely playing, competing, mocking Ukrainian players. Um, uh, uh, in, in international tennis tournaments, and, and it's going to talk about um, having Russian athletes at the Olympic Games. Um, you know, what can we do to stop this? I mean, okay, I, I, okay, we, I we, I've got, to, I've got, to, I've got to leave it there, Bill. Uh, sorry, uh, Bertus, because we are nearing the end of the hour, Bill. Well, I, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. You're absolutely right that there, <clears throat> there should be no Russian or Belarusian uh, athletes um, competing, nor should they be allowed to compete under a neutral flag. That this is the cost of of being a part of a country that's um, uh, conducting a, a murderous genocidal war. It's completely correct. And, and, you're right, and, and thank you for, for bringing up the, the, um, the history of, of how apartheid ended. It ended because we didn't allow it. You know, we, we, we condemned it across the globe. We stopped the athletes and we stopped trading. And that, that was what pushed it back and pushed it over the edge. And that's what we have to do here uh, with Russia in terms of sanctions and in terms of culture, in terms of athletes, et cetera. Bill, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you very much indeed. And if you want to help Bill push his book up the bestseller charts, it hasn't got far to go. It is called Freezing Order, a true story of Russian money laundering, murder and surviving Vladimir Putin's wrath. Thank you very much for coming in. Now, in the next hour, we're going to talk about something which was brought up on Cross Question last night about trophy hunting. I was rather surprised that two of my panellists actually agreed that it should continue. Well, there's a bill going through Parliament tomorrow, uh, backed by the government. It's a private member's bill, but backed by the government, which would ban trophy hunting, the deliberate shooting of big game in southern Africa. But it could be derailed by recalcitrant Tories like Christopher Chobu doesn't like any private member's bill at all. Is there any defence that anyone can put up for trophy hunting? Now, countries in Southern Africa actually do put up a defence. They say it leads to better conservation. We'll debate that over the course of the next hour. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, there could be an end to most of the NHS strikes in England after several unions said they would recommend a new pay deal to their members. It includes a lump sum payment for the current financial year and a 5% pay rise for next. Wes Streeting is Labour's Shadow Health Secretary. He's told LBC it didn't need to take this long. We could have been in this position before Christmas when the unions offered to suspend strike action just to negotiate on pay. And I think the government made a serious